I'd like you to take your Bibles and open to Exodus chapter 1. We're going to have a word of prayer, but on our way there, I just want to just give you a little preview. This week is about two things. This week is about, in the beginning, looking at God's shaping of a man, Moses. I think, personally, it's one of the coolest stories in the Bible. I like a lot of the stories, though, i got to tell you. Um, one of the reasons I think it's one of the coolest stories is because God really works hard to draw out the call of Moses. The book is 40 chapters. Five of them get him in the game. That means it takes a whole series of chapters just to get him in the game. By the way, he gets a whole two chapters of arguing with God, which almost nobody in the Bible gets. <laughs> Usually at the end of that, they're like a little ash spot on the carpet. But I mean, you know, God really does deal with him in, a, in a, an incredible way. And that's helpful to me because you might be like him. You might be a little less than convinced that you're all that brilliant and able to do what God has called you to do. If you are, thank God for you. I have been in rooms full of people who thought they were, you know, God's gift to the rest of us. I'm really enjoying being in a room with people who go, yeah, I don't know if I can do this. You really can't, but you have Jesus and that's what you need. What I can tell you is that the first 19 chapters of the book are designed to tell you God uses cracked pots and broken people to get an incredible job done. Then you get to chapter 20, 21, 22, 23, and what you end up with are the very first of the three types of law, the civil code of law, or how do we get along on a camping trip for the next 38 years, five months, and 20 days? because we're not all that easy to get along with, it's tense, there's noise, you, you, your chicken woke up my baby, we got lots of problems. <laughs> then you get to uh, 24 and there's a, uh, we pledge our commitment to this, and by chapter 25 to 40 you have a story of a building plan, because all great church stories have a building plan in it. No, because God knew that people needed to see something more than this ethereal, yes, I worship a God I cannot see. They needed to have a place to go. They needed to see an animal shed its blood and understand substitutional atonement. So we're going we're gonna to work our way through those things. Now, you have to marvel at how defiant the people were. How many times you have complaining Israelites. And you have to wonder why Moses stuck with them. You, you really do. Um, Knowing myself, I would have been tempted to resign and send, you know, my resume to the Amorites or Jebusites or whatever other ites were around and try to see if I could maybe catch another gig instead of the Israelites, because they're not a bargain. And until recently, I really didn't understand something that I pass on to you, and that is, when you open up Exodus, this isn't the same group of people as at the end of Genesis. Genetically, they're the children of them, but what happens after 10 generations of slavery? What happens to people that are ex-slaves that haven't been making their own decisions about anything for 10 generations? What happens to people over a 400-year period when get, they get told when to work, where to work, and what to produce? A slave culture isn't like uh, a, a free culture. And in fact, in many ways, slave cultures have given us some of the greatest maladies we continue to have on the planet. I, I want you to understand there was a generation that walked into Egypt as free men. But by the time you open up Exodus, one generation after another has been denied essential human rights and lost their dignity in such a way as they become seriously impaired to making good decisions. They don't know how to run a society. Why? They've been slaves. Slaves aren't noted for great administrative control. So here's the thing. One of the things you're going to have to understand is that Moses is not inheriting the children of Abraham pristine from the Abrahamic village. He's getting the children of Abraham after they went through the laundry wash of 10 generations of being slaves. So they think differently. And I think what's helpful to me is when you open up Exodus, somewhere make a note in your mind or your Bible or something that, that what's happening in our society is people are coming in from a raw, unchristianized, unbelieving society now. They don't have the, the delicacies of being a tr direct child of Abraham. You understand where I'm going with this? 
Now they've, they've come from a, a raw, sinful world and got dropped into the church. And I think Exodus is a primer for how you get people who haven't been God-thinking to get on board with God. I think that's one of the benefits of the book. I like this book because it tells me that you don't have to grow up in a church to become valuable to God. You can grow up in the world and have, have none of the strengths and restraints and strong community that come with walking with God as a child. You can come in from the outside as a blazing unbeliever and get dropped into the community of faith and, and God can still use you. I like that. Why do I like that? Because I don't know if you've noticed, we're not a majority in the country anymore. And so if we're going to make a difference, it's going to be because people are going to be reached from that raw, unbelieving community. Now, as we reach out to people and lead them to Christ, new people come in. And they, they struggle to understand what we're all about. They don't really understand right away. There's a man who struggled to reflect what God was doing in him. And that's going to happen in your life. Let's say next year, one of you ends up in a public university. In a way, you're like a Moses. You're surrounded by a people that have a history of being on board with God in our country, but that was generations ago, and they don't really, it doesn't affect how they live. Suddenly, you have to be able to show, how is God at work in me in front of people who have pretty worn out nerves when it comes to all things spiritual? Does, does that make sense? So the story of Moses can be your story. I'm not saying you're going to lead the people on an exodus and part water. I'm saying that you're going to walk into a university and have a little Bible study group and you're going to reflect how God is changing your life in front of people who have largely been slaves to sin. And, and that is going to help them see something. Now, behind this first lesson, which I want to take from 1-1 all the way to 2-10, that's my, that's my slice. I want to talk about the purpose of the whole account of Exodus first. And second, I want to see if I can outline what is the foundation of the nation that God was building out of a rabble in the Egyptian desert. Okay. One of the underlying questions of the book. This is one you write down. One of the underlying questions of the book is why does God allow punishing times of trouble in our lives? The book opens up on a canvas of struggle. It's painted right over struggle as its backdrop. And if God cares about them, why are they being enslaved and beaten? What kind of God do they serve that lets them go into to slavery? Seriously, guys, do you really want to sign on with a God that may send you into slavery? So, so the question is, since the text opens with heartbreak, what kind of God do you serve? What, what kind of God is this? Why does he allow punishing times of trouble? By the way, that's a motif or a backdrop or a canvas you're going to see over and over and over in the Bible. Here's what I want you to know. Despite what the guys with the 13 suits and 13 sermons and televangelism are saying, God didn't promise your life to be easy. He did not promise the people that came to Jesus in Baghdad last year that they won't be beheaded this year. He didn't. So God and here's my key principle, might approve trouble for your life. If he thinks that's what's going to bring out your obedience and he thinks that's what's going to tie to his story, he may bring trouble to your life. God's prescription might be for you to go through trouble. If you don't like that, you're not going to like this book. By the way, if you don't like that, you're not going to like this God. Because that's who he is. So, let me give you some two foundational notes here. When you open up the first six verses, here's a foundational note. Recognize the page is turned. In verses 1 to 6, this isn't the same group of people. Look at verse 6. Joseph died and all his brothers and all that generation. What does that say? That says that the profound lessons of life that were etched into them, faith that were etched into their lives, were gone. That generation was gone. The generation that you're reading about now is a different generation with a different set of values, with a different set of problems. They remember that Abraham lived, but they never met him. That was hundreds of years ago. They know Abraham the way you know George Washington. You, you, they learned about him in Sabbath school or what? I mean, you know, something. I, I don't know. But you know what I'm saying. Second thing I want you to know, the first one is that the page is turned. You have to understand you're not dealing with the same people. When you get to the end of Genesis, 
Now 400 years, dot, 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 now Exodus. You're not dealing with people just hot off the Abrahamic sands. Second, we have to understand that God's leftover blessing in keeping his word to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was being met in the world with deep resentment. Here's what I want you to understand. God promised, I'm going to bless you, Abe. I'm going to bless your children. Yitzhak, I'm going to bless you. Yaakov, I'm going to bless you. Yosef, I'm going to bless you. But that was met by the world with deep resentment. As God blesses believers, unbelievers will resent them. They don't want you to be blessed. They want to use your faith to bless themselves. They want you to vote for their cause and use your wealth to, to put it in their pocket. They're not interested in Christian blessing. They're interested in how they can co-opt it for whatever they're a part of. Now, where do I get that? Look at verse 7. The sons of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and, and in the event of war, they will join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. There's absolutely no evidence that that's true at all. He's just looking at the sheer size of them and feeling threatened by the size. There's no political background to them lobbying with the Moabites or whatever. It's, it's, it doesn't exist. So out of fear, they look with resentment at the blessing of God. So first thing, the page is turned. Second thing, the world isn't happy with the progress of believers. Every time we study God's word closely, we see a canvas of struggle on which God is painting his story. That's important for you to understand. Now, this is part of the purpose of the book, to explain the purposes of God to a young generation of believers. I want you to understand something. This rabble of ex-slaves is going to become the nation that's going to set the pattern all the way through the four Gospels until God initiates his work in the church. And that pattern is going to be, how do I get this rabble to understand what a meaningful relationship is with God and what my purposes are for them as a nation? So in a way, Exodus is for Israel what Acts is for the church. Does that make sense? So now we're in the kind of book of Acts for Israel. And it is the acts of God to draw Israel into the story. Is everybody tracking with me? And when you read the story, it's a pretty good story, isn't it? I mean, you got death, destruction, parting waters, all kinds of cool stuff. People get swallowed up in the, in the earth. How cool is this? But, but beside that, there's, there's something that has to happen. I need you to see this because it's a very excellent lesson for believers of this generation. I'm going to call chapter one painful separation. And what I mean by that is very simply this. If believers don't learn that they're supposed to be in the world and not of the world, they become enculturated. What is an enculturated believer? One who goes by the world's standards and doesn't look really any different. Yeah, we would call them 21st century Christians. They dress like everybody else. They talk like everybody else. Every movie that uh, unchristian people see, they see. Okay, maybe they don't go to the triple X adult theater, but basically everything short of blatant porn and child pornography, they're laughing at the same jokes everybody else is. What happens is when you become enculturated and you become so much like the world, God can really only maneuver one of two things. He can either convict you out of the world or get them to kick you out. Let me give you some progression to this text because I think it's going to help you to see something. If you go back to verse 6, I read verse 6 to you. Joseph died, all his brothers, all that generation. I want you to see something. Being in the world and not of, of the world is a question of purpose. How are you in the world but not of the world? What does that mean? I mean, it sounds like a really catchy thing from 1 John, but what does it mean? How do I live in the world but not of the world? Okay. Values is a, cr a critical word, right? So you, you don't move to a monastery to live for Jesus. I mean, you can, but that's not necessary. Um, you live inside the systems that the world has created without the values of those systems. Okay, notice that 
the group of people that knew God. Joseph, who, who has a stronger statement of knowing God and having a great perspective and value system than Joseph? Yeah, you chucked me in a hole and said I was dead, but really God had a purpose for this. Come on. Do you know anybody with that good an attitude? Seriously? I have never met that Christian. I, I've read about him, but I have never met him, okay? Everybody I know would go, you chucked me in a hole, I'm going to kill you all. Okay? Now, now that I got you awake, here's what's important. In verse 6, you need to see that the, the purpose principle is that we're to be in the world, but not of the world. God's people came to the world to be a testimony and an influence. Do you see that in verse 6? What was Joseph doing in Egypt? He was there because he was sold there. But his conclusion at the end of the story is God put me here to save you and Egypt. It's beneficial that we're here and we'll all survive because I'm here. Great. Now here's the problem. It starts with a godly purpose. But in my opinion, in verse six, what the writer is telling you, the writer who is Moses, is making this clear statement. We outstate our welcome. We, we lived there and we started off with a good purpose, but in the end, we got comfortable. See, that's verse seven. They grew in number, they grew in power, they grew in influence, and they were happy. There's nothing wrong with people being happy, except for they overlived what God had given. Where was the promised land for the Jewish people? Northeast of where they were. Why weren't they in it? Well, because they were, they were, what? Comfortable. Comfortable. And see, the problem was that prosperity moved in and people forgot their initial call to be a distinct people. That's what happens. The truth is, what's happening right now is Christianity has been deeply infected by the maladies of our culture. And by Christianity being singled out and kicked out, God is doing us a favor. It's not fun. It's not comfortable. It's good. Because here's what we're finding out. We're finding out a whole bunch of Christians really don't know what's in the Bible and don't really care. They just want to say they're Christian but not really do anything that's countercultural. Then we're finding that we have brothers and sisters around the world who are saying, stand up for the Bible. Stand up for God's word. Don't lie down. You go to Africa right now and you sit down with, uh, with our brothers in the churches across Central African Republic and they will plead with American pastors to grab the book and teach the book. You know why? Because they're facing Boko Haram, and if they're going to lose their head, they want to know we got their backs, at least spiritually, if not physically. It's perfectly reasonable what they're asking. Now, now keep going, because look at verses 8 through 12. When you pick up verses 8 through 12, you get this interesting set of statements. L listen to what he says. New King Rose, verse 9. Behold, the, they're more mighty than we are, verse 10. Let us deal wisely with them. Verse 11, so they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor, and they built for Pharaoh storage cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread out, so that they were in dread of the sons of Israel. So in verse 12, you get the definite impression that God is running counter to cross purposes with the Pharaoh. Pharaoh is trying to make them weaker, God's making them stronger. It didn't work it. You don't persecute truth into non-existence. It doesn't work. What's interesting is, go, uh, look at the faithfulness principle. When I pick up verses 8 through 12, God is faithful to his promises and he finishes what he starts. Even in their disobedience, God was preserving them. Why? Because God's faithful to what he promised Abe. When God says, I'm going to do something, he's going to do it. He's going to do it when the kids don't know he's going to do it. He's going to do it when the kids fuss at him doing it. If he says, I'm going to bless your kids and their kids and their kids, and I'm going to, I'm going to make of you a great nation, guess what he's going to do? He's going to make of you a great nation even if you don't want him to. He's going to do it. God's plan for his children was to not overstay their time. But they didn't look beyond there. They weren't looking back at their homeland going, you know what, we really should get out of here. I mean, we're taking up all of Goshen here. We ought to go up to the promised land and get back to where we belong. Anybody got any of those uh, old sayings from our fathers? What, what were we told to do anyway? Nobody was doing that. So God approved trouble to make them obedient. I see in verses 8 through 12 the same thing that I see in, say, Acts chapter 12. 
where persecution came down on the church and suddenly they went out and became what they were supposed to be. See, what Jesus said to them in Acts 1.8 is you'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And then for the next couple chapters, they all grabbed each other's hands, stood around the fire, sung kumbaya, and nobody left. Nobody became witnesses to anybody else. We're doing Jerusalem. We love Jerusalem. Kumbaya, I'll be in Jerusalem. And then God brought a persecution and all of a sudden they went to the uttermost parts of the earth. Why? Because they were running to save their necks. But sometimes God brings trouble to bring about obedience. That was the point. Now, it's interesting because you look at verse 13 and 14 and I see this pain principle. Pain is a powerful, positive tool when God is the one using it. It's a natural teacher. It causes us to reflect when we resist normal reflection. When you're in pain, you start reflecting, okay? So you get to verses 13 and 14, and um, you start to see it will not separate. If we're not going to separate ourselves from the world, pain is going to cause us to see ourselves as distinct. Look at verse 13. The Egyptians compelled the sons of Israel to labor rigorously, and they made their lives bitter with hard labor in mortar and bricks and at all kinds of labor in the field, and all their labors which they rigorously imposed on them. Everybody in America is ready to go flocking to a preacher that says, come to Jesus and you're going to get wealthy. I'd like to know who's ready to go flocking to the preacher that says, come to Jesus, and they might enslave us in the next generation. They just might. They just might. I'm not sure the Christian message would have that little upturn that the televangelists like. Here's what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to be snotty. I'm just saying that God uses painful processes. And if you don't agree to that, then you don't understand what God is doing in the text. He does it in our lives. He does it in the text. Now, what I think is interesting is if you get down to verses 15 and 16, I want you to, this is a principle I call the membership principle. It's um, the world's not your home. This, this isn't your home. And because that's true, you're on a journey to get to your home. But you're not like the people that live here. You're not. And, and you're not to try to be like them. So in verse 15 it says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom was named Shifra, and the other was named Puah. And he said, When you are helping the Hebrew uh, women to give birth and to see them upon their birth stool, if it is a son, then you shall put it to death. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Now, what's interesting about this story is you start to realize that when believers won't admit that they're not at home here, God puts them in a position where the unbeliever admits that you're not one of them. You're not welcome in America if you want the values of our founding fathers. You're not welcome here in any public university anymore. That's just the truth. So you better grasp now, this isn't, if you're going to spend your life trying to make America happy, you are not going to make God happy. You're going to have to make a choice. What I find interesting in my life is that, is that as I go through the scriptures, I find that God often brings about the pain to give, dis, to, to give disobedient believers obedience. Now, look at verses 17 to 21. Here's a standing principle, as in standing on my feet, standing principle. It's better to stand for the next truth, even though you failed on the last 10 truths. Do you, do you understand what I mean? You, can, can all of us understand, you could conclude, well, you know, we've been such lousy testimonies, you know, well, we might as well, you know, just conform. And, and God says, no, standing up for me means starting where you are. You can't fix yesterday. You can only start today and fix tomorrow. That's all you can do. Yesterday's done. So here's a group of people that have basically overstayed their welcome, been swallowed up by the e Egyptians. And he says, let the midwives, but the midwives, what did they do? They feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt had commanded them, but let the boys live. Stop right there. This is the first case you see in the Bible of what is otherwise known as civil disobedience. What is civil disobedience? Somebody tell me. Um, in the Bible, do I have the right to disobey God? Uh, to disobey uh, civil authority. I'm sorry. What is the condition in the scriptures for which I could... Um, they go against God's law. 
So that means if they want to fight a war that I think is unjust, I don't pay my taxes? No. Okay, what does it mean? It means that they're blatantly telling you specifically to do something that you don't agree with. Like you mentioned, say gay marriage is okay, and they're specifically asking you to do that. You can't do that because it's against what God specifically said. So civil disobedience seems to be, can, can we make this statement? First, God normally operates by um, respect for authority and obedience to authority. That's the norm, right? So now we're talking about something very small inside a very large norm. And in certain cases in the Bible, specific cases, God accepted disobedience to civil authority because that civil authority took a direct shot at something God had said they cannot and should not do. In this case, it's not killing babies. It's killing Hebrew babies. In other words, God said, I'm going to bless your nation. I'm going to make it big. So you're not allowed to do things to not make it big. God said, this is a child, but this is not just a child. This is a child of promise. I have said, I'm doing this. You cannot stop them. So now these ladies are forced into a position. Now, in civil disobedience, make a note somewhere in your Bible, everywhere where it shows up, that yes, you can disobey and God will honor it and you still might end up in the mouth of a lion. There's no implication in any of the passages that I can find in Scripture that civil, civil disobedience won't end up in your martyrdom. So you might have to die or not get a college education or not get a good job or be enslaved. You, you might have to suffer the penalty of disobedience. You don't get a pass because you did right before God. That's what I'm trying to say. He doesn't go, well, since you were doing it for me, I'll just make sure I promote you anyway. That's not the story. Sometimes that happens. Three guys get tossed into a fiery furnace, a fourth one shows up, and God has a little conference in the fire. Lots of fun, they all walk out, they don't even smell like smoke, and the guys who threw them in get burned. Or you get thrown in a lion's den and the lions just get indigestion and sit there and look at you all night. That is a possibility. But you know, God would have still been God if Daniel got et. I just made up that. If he was eaten, God would still be God. We, we have this idea that we love the story because he wins. He won when he did what God said. Not when the right outcome happened in his life. So let me say it this way. Always do right. Never do wrong to do right. Always do right. Don't go, well, I'm going to compromise my principles because this is the higher... No, you do right. That's what you do. Now, what's interesting is I can't tell what these midwives were really up to. I can't tell if they slowed down their walk on the way to delivering babies or if they were telling something that was factually untrue when they were asked. But listen to these words. M midwives said to Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh says, why did you let them live? And the midwives said, uh, the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. Now, this is the wrong thing to say when the guy's already paranoid that the Hebrews are going to get strong and the Egyptians are going to get weak. They open their mouth and say exactly the wrong thing and feed the fear. They say, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife can get to them. You know what I think they're doing? I think they're playing on his stereotype. I think he sees these um, very strong Israelites and kind of weak Egyptians, you know why? Because when you lay on the couch and direct the work, you're not as strong as the guy who's lifting the boulder. That's why. So all of a sudden, he's confirming his own conclusions. And they say, you know, these wives, they just, the baby's popping out left and right. You know, come on. So God was good to the midwives. And the people multiplied and became very mighty because the midwives feared God. He established households for them. I can't tell you whether what they were saying was true or not. I suspect they didn't lie. I suspect what they did was slow down. I suspect they did a pull the work slow down and didn't show up until the babies were born and only came into those that were emergency situations. So that they could turn around and go, yeah, I don't know, by the time I got there, you know, the baby was already born. It was nothing for me to do. And I suspect that that's what they did, which was not a violation. By the way, a lie would have been a lie. You don't do wrong to do right. What I do find here is um, 
because this world is not your home, we constantly have to be reminded that we're on a journey. So what I want you to understand is that they have a choice to make. They're put in a situation where they could do the wrong thing because everybody's been doing the wrong thing. We're in, we're in Egypt, essentially, because we've overstayed our welcome. We've done it all wrong up till now, so why not just do it wrong? No, here's the thing. Compounding wrongs is not the way forward. The way forward is to drive a, a, a stake in the ground and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to live for God in spite of the fact that I wasn't last week. Okay? Now, something interesting happens in verses 22 and 23. And it actually, uh, 22, I'm sorry, 22 all the way to 2, 3, I, not to 23. Um, 122, then Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, every son who is born you are to cast into the Nile and every daughter you are to keep alive. Which, you know, honestly, it's going to really pollute the Nile. When you really think about it, it's really a dumb plan. Um, verse 1, now a man from the house of Levi went and married a daughter of Levi. The woman conceived, bore a son, and when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him for three months. But when she could not hide him any longer, she got him a wicker basket, covered it over with tar and pitch, and she put the child into it and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Can I make a note here? She was creative but obedient. She was told to throw her son in the Nile. She did. Nobody said anything about not having a basket. Okay? So would you just be open to the idea that sometimes obedience requires a little bit of creativity? When you keep the larger story, here's what you find. The women stood up to Pharaoh, and they were the element that was larger in the story. Can we just start the story the right way? The story of the Exodus began with brave women. That's how it began. So let's not make them like, you know, little addendums to the story. You do not get the sense, reading Jacob's story, that the women were inconsequential to the story, do you? No, they're saying, okay, who, this is the bed you're going to tonight. Okay. You know, he's just going like red, led around with a nose ring. And, and, and the bottom line is that when you get to Moses' story, don't miss that the story opens with strong midwives and a strong mama. Okay? What I think is interesting here is women stood up and then God was about to send an answer to the needs of his people. He used women of strength and courage to bring a leader. And what I want you to understand is that most often it's a godly woman who is at the beginning of the life of a godly going to be man. I think that's important. Let's stop, let's stop treating motherhood like it's some back burner thing when you can't get a good career, okay? It's more important than any career you're ever going to serve in because ev almost every godly man or woman that is, a, is functioning in society today will point back to some godly person in their early life and many of them look like mom. So let's not pass over this part too easy. That there's something really interesting about verse 22 to, verse, to, to chapter 2 verse 3. These, this, this woman conceives and bears a son she puts him in the basket, and God is sculpting the answer in this child's life. Now, here's what I want you to understand. Yocheved, or Jochebed, however you say this, um, marries Amram. I know their names because Exodus 6 gives their names. You don't see them here, you see them in Exodus 6. But here's the thing. Look at the godly heritage that they had. First of all, do you see in verse 1, where can I pick out a godly heritage? Levi, children of Levi. And the Levites will be noted in Scripture as being the people that specifically help bring God's truth to the, people, to, to, to the greater number. I, I, let me just make this note, and you don't have to do anything with it, but never underestimate the value of a godly heritage. Some of you can't, grew up in a Christian family and somehow you feel like disadvantaged because you don't have a cool testimony. Um, you're not disadvantaged. You are advantaged. You don't, you, don't have to, you don't have to live in slime to know slime is slime, okay? You don't have to try sin to know that it's sin. You can pretty much live in this world and go, yeah, seeing what that did to other people, don't need it in my life. I know the more cool testimonies are always, you know, I was a striptease bar worker at age seven and then God got my life, you know, but honestly, don't, don't please don't go there, okay? Just, just deal with the fact that God has made you who you are and given you a godly heritage if you have one and praise God for it. Second, 
I want you to see that this woman had a commitment to her marriage. She married, uh, that he married to a daughter of Levi and the commitment to the two of them was what made the commitment to the child's welfare sweet. So here's what I see. Look at verse two. When you read verse two, I want you to read it very slowly because in verse two, it says the woman conceived bore a son and when she saw that he was beautiful, that's not what the Hebrew says. She didn't see that he was beautiful. The word is she gazed at the child. Now you have to look at a mom with a baby to get this. I know that Yocheved knew every little dent in that child's face. Every curve, every soft little piece of skin tissue was known to that mama. The woman conceived, she bore a son. And I want you to see that the gaze of a mom to that child is a, is a gaze of love. Moses started his life in, a, in the arms of a loving mom. Moses started, in the life, uh, started his life in the arms of a mom who was hopeful and not impulsive. Look at verse 2. It ends with, she hit him for three months. She worked on a hopeful plan. How do I make this work? She came up with one. She said, okay, if anyone makes me swear that I put him in the Nile, I did. They didn't say anything about a boat. So I put him in a boat and put him in the Nile. Okay, and in even one step closer to that, she figured out a way to get the child the best angle towards survival. Because, you know, you put a baby in a boat and send him down the Nile, and that's probably not a good plan for success because he's not ready to be a pirate. He's a baby. So in verse 9, I want you to look at what it says. Pharaoh's daughter looks and says, take this child away and nurse him for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child, nursed him. The child grew and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son and she named him Moses. That's, Moshe is the uh, drawing out, drawing out because I drew him out of the water. Now here's the thing. God orchestrated through a creative and careful and loving and hopeful woman, not an impulsive one. Can we, all, can we all just agree in this room that Moses was born into a home in the crappiest time to be a Jew born into a home this side of World War II? Okay, it's not a good prospect being a baby boy under Pharaoh born at that time. But God is providing an answer and he's doing it through a woman who's going to be careful, compassionate, caring, loving, hopeful, you get impulsive and you lose the ability for God to work through your life. Get off the impulsive ledge. By the way, you all know what paired values are? Did we talk about it all, paired values? Do you know what paired values are? Paired values are the difference between how you feel about the guy when you date him and how you feel about the guy when you're married to him. Okay? So the word spontaneous before you're married, when you're still starry-eyed in love, he's so spontaneous. What's the paired value of spontaneous when now you're mad at him? Irresponsible. Irresponsible. The man can't make a plan. <laughs> the thing you fall in love with will be the very thing you're going to fight over. He's so generous. Give me the other one. He gives everything away. We're never going to have anything. He just gives it away. He lacks the sense to hang on to it. You know, I love him because he's a hard worker. He's a workaholic. I never even see the guy. These are the same values. If you didn't hear anything else you hear today, sometime in your life you may navigate into the marriage territory. If you do, no paired values. I can tell you by the three things you tell me you like about the person what the first three fights will be. I'm serious. I've been doing this 30 years. I'm serious. Because what happens is when you have the, the most positive sense you'll ever have of the person is at the dating stage and then after about 20 years. Okay? So at the dating stage, you have this incredible, he is just incredible. She is marvelous in form and function. She is unbelievable. Everything about her is just... Then you get married and then it kind of goes... Whoosh, and then it slowly comes out about the 20 year mark. You go, you know, she really is neat. <laughs> I'll tell you what. 
when you figure out that, you know, if you were her, you'd have killed you. Um, <laughs> that's, that's how it works. Okay, now what I'm asking you to do is understand the paired values situation. All right, let's get back to the text because I've got to finish this up. I, um, I think that when you end up with, at 2, 3, there's an image in Titus chapter 2, verse 5. The image is that women would be workers at home, but the word workers is probably not the best translation. I would say protectors at home. In the Bible, the security system for the home is mom. Make no mistake about it. Maybe he can shoot the gun, but she's got the teeth. She will gnaw you to death. Okay? I need, do you know that, there, that the image for a woman who defended her home is still common in parts of New York City in old brownstones on front steps? It is a lioness. Those lions by, beside the door, you know what those are? They're not him, they're her. The lioness was the idea that you want to mess with, you, you, you want to steal my stuff, steal my stuff. You touch my kid, I'll kill you dead. Just like that. You've never seen. I mean, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Well, wait, wait till you see a mama with somebody going after their a kid. You will never see anything more vicious in your life. She will bite you to death if she has to. And my point is that that is as it should be. Your child is put into your arms and you have a strong influence. Look, the room is split. Half of us are men and half of us are women. And the men get a lot of press in the Bible. So when the women get one, I'm going to stop and camp on it for a while. Because the reason is you're not an addendum. You're not a, like a, you know, a knockoff of the original. And because of original sin, and because of the penalties of original sin, it becomes easy for women to feel like the Bible shifted against them. It's not. I want to be very careful with you ladies. Godliness for your children will be largely executed through your mouth and your hands. In most homes, he's not going to do it. You are. Grab being a keeper at home. Make it a life call that's as significant to you as anybody has in their career call. Because here's what I'm going to tell you. Your lion taking your last breaths, it's not going to be your office colleagues standing around the bed. Okay? So get, get, get straight your priorities from the beginning. I'm not against women working. Please don't hear that. I'm not against women having great careers. I'm against them viewing women with babies as not having a career. That's what I'm against. They have a career. It's called that child. And by the way, it will drain them more than any work outside the home ever could. 24-7, you have a life dependent upon you. Some of you could barely get along with your little electronic dog that they gave you in high school. <laughs> Look, let me finish this by saying this. For the believer, life is not about comfort. It's not about fulfillment. It's not about fitting in. It's not about control. It's about pleasing my master. That's what it is. And if you try to make life about anything else, you will be disappointed. I guarantee you. You want to fit in? You'll fit in until you don't then they'll take your stuff. It's about pleasing your master. And by the way, life is short. You don't believe that yet because you're still sitting in class going, when is this going to end? But life really is short. You are going to blink and you're going to be my age. I mean, seriously, you're going to put on incredible numbers of years so fast and then they get faster and faster and faster because the more you're responsible for, the more you're thinking about so many things at one time that the day goes by and it's just like that. I want you to stop here for a minute and I want you to look at from chapter two, three, and four, after our break, we're gonna pick up first God's preparation of Moses, then God's call of Moses, then God's argument with Moses. This thing goes on, okay? But here's what I need you to see. You, you, you drop into chapter 2, and God heard the cries of his people. But he didn't put together a committee. He didn't raise up a political um, uh, uh, party. He got a guy, one guy, in the hands of a godly woman being shaped by her and raised that up, and that's what changed the nation. That's what formed the nation. So I want to... 
take that moment and be thankful for that lady because she's the lady behind the guy.